See the. Nope. Or should oh, we? Oh, yep. It's going. It's rolling. Okay. Should we turn? Should we do one? Yeah, that's there? a good idea. So can I find some YouTube as well? Google video. Which I don't see. Well, yeah. YouTube without the camera. No. Exactly. Okay. Uh, oops. So I guess we'll get started since uh, it's kind of late. And so my talk is entitled "A Practical Introduction to Sage." And I sort of have geared this towards uh, sort of freshmen and sophomore uh, undergraduates who are interested in math and interested in mathematical computing and visualizing math and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, so first I'll introduce Sage briefly. Um, so Sage is really free and open source mathematics software, and the goal, or is to create a viable, completely free, open source alternative to those four big M's there. So uh, it's a pretty freaking hard task, and uh, we're working on it. So what Sage is, though, is a distribution of a huge set, a huge range of available of existing open source mathematics software. It's also a a uh, brand new system with, hundred with like a with a hundred thousand lines of new code or so, two three hundred thousand lines of new code, including that. Okay, a lot of new code. So it's not just this software distribution. There's a lot more to it than that. And it's also a way of using all of your proprietary and free mathematics software, and you use the and you use the free mathematics software sort of transparently, so you don't even know that you're using it behind the scenes is the idea. So Sage so tries to connect these things. And so the history of Sage was, the first release was in February of 2005. So Sage is a very young project. It's not even three years old yet. Um, and it's pretty remarkable how far it's come in just those three years. And um, so we can fast forward on to the uh, the spring of last year when William got hired at UW as a professor of mathematics and he found a bunch of undergraduates including me who uh, were interested in working on SAGE who liked math and liked computer programming and that sort of thing so um, so there's a there's a lot of opportunity to be had working on SAGE so uh, so today we have Sage 2.8.6, which was released last week. Um, and there have been 154 releases of Sage since that February of 2005. So there's been a lot of work. It's a very fast moving project, with a lot of uh, momentum, and it's very active. So it's very exciting. So the system that you use when you use Sage, it, um, it leverages, like I said before, it uh, connects together a lot of free existing open source program so that we don't have to do a lot of the work. Um, it, a key advantage is Python, which is the language that you use when you interact with Sage. So um, instead of reinventing our own language like most mathematics, uh, most uh, computer algebra programs do, we use the existing one, Python. And a very nice thing about Python is it's object-oriented. And uh, this is actually very useful and flexible. It's a good abstraction for, for doing mathematics. And none of the big M's really uh, behave that way. So you can use Sage on the command line or, uh, or through the uh, web interface, which is Sage's GUI. And the, the web interface is called the notebook. And uh, it was just rewritten in June. So it's, it's pretty cool and pretty robust now. And you can use Sage on Linux, Mac OS X, and through virtualization you can use it in Windows. So, um, but, so like, uh, that may sound like, you know, like, oh, well, you know, if I have Windows, I can't really use Sage because who would want to use it over, you know, over some virtual machine? But it's actually pretty fast. And since, um, the uh, interface, the main interface to Sage is a web browser, basically. You can run Sage on some 
server that's not your home computer, and you can still use it from a Windows machine as long as it has a web browser. Can we make a comment about using it in Windows? If you um, buy for like $80 VMware workstation, then you can share files between Sage and your Windows file system. So you can edit files under Windows with the Windows editor and then just transparently use them within Sage, which is pretty nice. Um, and I've made some changes to Sage recently to make that easier to do. And so, so you can develop based off in Windows? Yeah, exactly. Because mm -hmm. there's there are, Dimitar, for example, does his development under Windows. And like Windows always wants to put .txt at the end of file names. So now you could say foo.sage.txt, and it'll still load it. It won't give you an error. So Sage will strip .txt extensions when you're loading or attaching files. So it's not developing for the library, but as an end user, you can develop without using a notebook, like directly files that you would attach. But you have to, I think VMware Player doesn't support this shared file system stuff, but Workstation okay. does. But if you're a Windows user, buying commercial software, that's just part for the course, right? <laughs> or obtaining commercial software. And VMware Workstation has a free 30-day trial that you can renew indefinitely. So it's not that bad. You had a comment? So I can't run under Sigma or something. It has to be a pool. Um, Sigma's a problem. Oh, yeah. We no, used to support Sigma's it, but it's, 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 it just doesn't, it's not, it doesn't handle what, uh, what it needs to be. Yeah, it's too slow, basically. Yeah. It's actually a lot faster using virtualization on most modern computers than Sigma, because Sigma does all kinds of funny business to try to interact with Windows, and virtualization just runs the code on your hardware with some very little overhead, at least on a modern machine with VTX extensions. And it's not just Sage, it's that all of these millions of, well, like millions, but there's lots of oh, open source so. math packages that are, you know, were written in the Unix environment that you'd have to port each one of those over to work, run on Sigma and then run under Windows. Yeah, yeah. which we did. Very, we did that for a while, but it it's just slower. Memory. I mean, it was better using VMware. The, the actual experience of using it was better by far. So, yeah, yeah. but but really, I mean, you can, as long as you have a Unix server or an OS X server somewhere, you can use Sage over the network, and it's a pretty good experience. Yeah. And also VMware Player is free. So and VMware Player, there. so yeah, you can, yeah. You just grab the package from, from the sage.math, or from sagemath.org. It's really easy to install on Windows. So, and then finally, the other good point that I think Sage has is it's very good context-sensitive uh, documentation, so it's very easy to figure out what you're supposed to do, usually, um, with a couple of simple keystrokes. So I'll show you that. So, um, so if you're if you're using Sage and you have some object like here, we assigned sine of x plus y to this variable f, and you want to find what you can do on f, you type f dot because f is an object. Python is a big oriented. Oh, my, yeah. my sorry. Um, so if you want to use that, uh, um, uh, you can, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so you type dot, and then you can hit tab, and all the list, the list of all the possible messages and attributes that uh, F uh, contains is, are listed for you, and uh, you can start typing something and it will narrow down the completions until you find what you want. You can click on it or hit enter or whatever. And I'll show you this more later. But so yeah, you can use this tab auto completion feature to figure out. And then once you figure out where, whether or not some function exists, you type question mark and hit tab again in the web interface and it comes up with a documentation for that. So it's very nice. So you have this constant context sensitive help. And then you can hit another question mark, and bam, you have the source code to, to that function. And I mean, you can't see the actual source code because in the Python source code, the, first, uh, the very first line of a function is its documentation string. So, but below that, you can see the source code. And in this case, it's trivial. It's a call to maxima, but uh, you know, to some other program. But um, so yeah, so you can find out what you need very easily that way. So, okay, I was going to demo um, a little bit of how you would use calculus, or Sage in sort of a calculus setting. So for some calculus type problems. So let me uh, make sure that it's started. It's not 
must do it. You're doing this on two screens. Okay, so the first thing you can do, a very basic calculation in SAGE. And uh, so here's a very difficult calculation, slightly harder. Um, that RR coerces the value into a real number. So otherwise, if we didn't do that... We can also do N of it nowadays. Oh, is N defined right now? Yeah, lowercase N. It's like in mathematical, but lowercase. So that works too. Yeah. So you can do N of sine of 2. And you can give it a second argument that's the number of bits, if you want, like a hundred bits. A thousand bits. Yep. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> so, as you can see, like, uh, immediately you don't have any problem with large numbers in stage or anything like that. It's just that works very well for you. So, you can find things to the correct precision. And there's a lot of nice things about that. Um, so, um, but of course, if you didn't get a symbolic or a numerical approximation of it, it would fit up. The symbolic, um, uh, the symbolic answer. So you can uh, so you can do nu numerical work. So here we've done evaluating numerically the very difficult integral, but you can see it's pretty close to uh, what it should be. Um, uh, rational numbers. When you divide two integers, you get a rational number out of it. Something complex numbers. So. Okay. So here's one thing that uh, will throw people off if you've ever used um, Maple or Mathematica. Single letter, letter variables aren't just symbolic variables. They are uh, not defined at first. So we get an exception when we try to do that. What you have to do is you actually have to declare the variable. And the, the argument there has to be the name of the variable in the form of a string, uh, which you surround in quotes. So if we want to make a variable called y, we have to do var of y, but in quotes. And then we make y. So now we're in better shape, and we can get y squared. Okay. And you can also give different names to variables. So now theta is defined, and you can use show to see things in Sage. So showing theta, so it's smart enough to know that it should type it nicely. Um, uh, so yeah, let's uh, build up some basic functions. And let's see, so here's a simple function. There's another. And then there's the ratio of those two functions. OK, now let's see what the limit as y approaches infinity of this function is. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Let's, let's look at a plot. So I can see. So to use to, to plot something in Sage, you use the plot command. And the thing that you want to pl plot, and there are different options you can use. And you can get them by looking at the documentation. There's a bunch of different options to use. Um, so here, I've made a plot from negative 2 to 10. And I've set some thickness and, and whatnot. And I've changed it. And then, so if you just, if, you were to, if I were to call this without the show command, without the show command, it would do Turn a graphics object, which is not what you want. So instead of just plotting something, you also need to show it. So you have to do that. You plot something. So you do dot show on that as well. Right. You could do yeah. So we could do dot. 
Or you can save the graphics object. Or sure. Like. That's one. That's another thing. So you can do like this. Oops. There's a dot at the end. You should show that you can save it as a PDF or other different things. Oh, the whole. Uh, yeah, you can do like g dot save, and then give it a, a file name that is in PDF, and then you get a PDF. So do this. Or you dot. You can save in a whole bunch of different formats. So like uh, different formats that you can, like a PNG or PDF really works too. Most of the time, yeah, actually, huh. it's not officially complete in Matplotlib, but. In you know, a lot of cases, it can actually save the PDF directly, which is pretty cool, actually. Does it give me an error? No. Nope. Okay. So there's a leak. And then you can include hey. that in a in document, a, with, a like a PDF font document. But it's still vector graphics instead of the image. It's very nice, actually. Okay, so so going back to this function, so we can see that it goes up at y equals negative one, and um, we can compute the limit directly in Sage, and we get two, which this kind of didn't. Uh, It's hard to tell from this plot, but of course the limit actually is two, and you can sort of see that from the function that it should be two. But you know we can uh, change the range. Yeah, nice. And so here we're only computing from negative one half to ten, and you can see that yeah, it sort of goes up to two, which is what you'd expect. We can do basic differentiation and integration in Sage, just like uh, you'd expect in any uh, uh, in any uh, mathematics self-respecting <laughs> self-respecting self <laughs> computer algebra system. So, <laughs> so there is. So I sim I should. So if I were to just instead, if I were to just show, this is very difficult. I can't. I wish this was mirrored. Oh, I had to. Maybe you could just sit on a chair and point yeah, yourself in without inflicting your. I don't know if I'll. Here, I think. Um, don't I don't know if I'm blocking the. Uh, you probably are. But here, hold on. Don't sit down. Here. In purple. Oh. That's not good. There you go. Oh, yeah, it works. Your head's not in view. Oops, that's not good. Okay, that's better. Okay. So, um, so this is the thing, and there are different um, options for simplifying. And see what they, like, you know, how would you figure out what they were? Well, just type prime dot, and then you get this massive thing with everything you can do on this object prime. And so the easiest way to try and simplify is to start typing it. Yes. Tab again, very different simplify options, and then you know, so look at this and see what it's so you can get documentation on what it's supposed to do. Um, so, so there it is simplified, get the integral. Um, So yeah, here's something else it's showing the integral, the indefinite integral that it computes. We can give it. You know, we can give it. Let's see, make sure that this is actually defined over here. Something like that, and you can get the results that way. So here's 
function um, that when we evaluate it, Sage does not know how to evaluate this function, or the integrate this function. So it just returns the function back. But we might be able to use Sage to get it into a more uh, easily readable form to evaluate. And sure enough, if we first use this radical simplify, then it can evaluate it. So, um, and the reason that it doesn't do this automatically is because it's not a uh, it's not a computationally tractable problem to figure out. I mean, so simplifying isn't even well defined, anyways. So, what will you try is the question. And so, you do have to use a little bit of cleverness. It won't just always give you the answer, like any system. Um, but you can see what it did here. It wrote, "This is two to the two x," and then you can use. Uh, 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 trigonometric substitution techniques to try to evaluate the integral. But couldn't, couldn't see that directly without first doing that radical simplify. So I thought that was sort of interesting. So, okay, so you can evaluate functions at a point. So like here's, um, so yeah, h is the, this function here. And here it is at 10, for example. There's a numerical approximation that also works, and of course, this works too, which is like in Mathematica. It um, goes to h of 10 dot n. If you like, you're, you don't want to backspace to the beginning of the line, and you just want to, so, yeah, h of 10 dot n, open close, yeah, you can do it at the end, which is nice. Um, so, okay, so let's see, we have, there's a function of two variables, and you can see if we try to compute f of pi, it will assume that it's, the x is what you want. If we want y, we have to type it in this way, which is saying y equals some value, and then it will do the substitution for you. Okay, and yeah, we get, it does some simplifying and gives you a sign of x. Um, okay. Um, well, also, if you notice, if you if you were carefully watching, I didn't actually call var of x. So x is the one thing which is defined as a symbolic expression. So you don't have to make a variable for that, but um, that's the one thing. And the reason for that is x, or you know, all these things are actually Python objects floating around, and it pollutes the namespace essentially, and leads to very confusing error messages in certain cases where. Um, you forget to evaluate a cell, where you define something, forget to ev evaluate a cell, and um, uh, you, know, you define something as, let's say, like k. And then k is no longer, or k, you forget to evaluate the cell where you define k, so k is a symbolic expression in a variable. So it leads to a very confusing error message about trying to do something with k um, when, it's, uh, when it's really, when you really mean for k to be something else. So, the, that's the main reason why we don't have that. Um, it's different and it seems annoying at first, but you get used to it. It's not so bad at all to work with. So, uh oh, if we want to try this, it won't work. Okay. And in general, the reason that that won't work is because, well, it's a bad example of it, but. Uh, which is which variable should be zero? Which variable should be pi? We don't know what order they're in now. If you have just x and y, it's pretty clear to you. But what if you have, you know, t omega x y z? I mean, all these different variables. So um, the solution for that is to define a uh, a uh, callable symbolic expression. And a callable symbolic expression. Note that you have this. On the left-hand side of the assignment statement, you have um, this little function notation. Instead of just giving it a name, you're now giving it, you're now saying what variables it has and you know what order those variables should appear. So if we define this, which is just really syntactic sugar for doing this, and yeah, so it creates this which is a function from x and y in that order to, um, to you know, that gets mapped. So this is a function that's mapping x and y to this. Then, this. then this substitution makes sense because we've established an order 
for that. So uh, that's just a standard way of working. Uh, if you want to be able to substitute stuff in and out. Uh, yeah, so that's what I just explained. So you can also use Sage to solve some equations, simplify the tedia. So there's all the complex solutions to polynomial. Um, uh, so I'll we'll introduce a new variable, and here I've got this nasty little um, set of conditions on x, y, and z, and it's trying to solve the system. And sure enough, it gives you the answer. So you can use it to, to make your life a little easier when doing tedious calculations. Um, yeah, so that's the basic gist of using symbolics in Sage. There's a lot more. Um, that you can go into if you type, um, you know, again, like make a symbolic expression and see what you can do with it. So we got H. We can do lots of things. We can tailor expansion. So we need to give it variable. We need to give it a um, number of terms and, oh no, I'm sorry, a point say around zero and number of terms and oh right it's not what if uh oh here Um, lots of other things. Uh, so yeah, that's the basic gist of that sort of thing. And so I also have um, uh, something written by William, which I'm going to just steal and <laughs> show you guys to have sort of a different flavor um, of using Sage sort of computationally and how you might use it in a setting. Um, okay, so this is an introduction to Fourier theory, and it was written for uh, talented high school students. So, um, so like here's how you might use Sage to come up with this square wave. And so, this is getting into the Python syntax a little bit. And to make a function in Python, you define a, uh, a function with the, with the def keyword, and it, um, uh, you can return certain objects, and so this returns a line, which is a way to plot lines, and there's a lot of pretty examples that you can get here. So what this function really does is it just plots a line passing through these vertices, and, and shows the plot loops. Shows the plot of them. So, okay. so, um, so yeah. So there you go. You get this nice square wave. And um, uh, here's the periodic uh, extension of the Fourier series of this square wave. Sheet you see it? Yeah, I did, but I think I tried it out on the other server. So maybe I should just go over to that server. You want it? something to change? So there's no things could have things could stop working because
Maybe F is defined in a funny way or something. So it's having trouble evaluating F. Yeah. Wait, what is did that? You, did you... What did I'm you find sure it is. Right here, it, it returns the, uh, the, the partial sum. But Does it work now? No. no. Try evaluating F at a single point. Of a one comma fifty or something. Yeah. Could have to do the sine of one point zero times i. What is i? Maybe i is squared of minus 1. Yeah, that's unlikely to work. I think you're putting a complex number in for the cube. Yeah, change, get rid of that i. Yeah, that's the problem. Because that i was, it was a complex number i, I think. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. Enjoy some pizza. Okay. Well, okay. So anyway, so now we get this. Um, very nice um, plot of the two different things. And so you see, this is useful in returning the plot. So instead of showing it directly, S, oops. So instead of returning, instead of plotting the thing directly, it's assigned to a variable s, and then we assign um, some other things. And then this silly little lambda notation just makes an anonymous function, which all it does is takes x and returns the expression after the colon as a function of x. Um, or, so it, it makes, it creates an anonymous function that takes x and returns this function. Uh, or that returns this uh, evaluation, or this here evaluated. And then notice this plus equals. So what it's doing is it's adding together plots. So it takes one plot, adds on another plot, adds on another plot, adds on another plot. And adding together two plots, two graphics objects actually, um, will superimpose the plots on the same image so that you can see them. And so that's what's happening here. And uh, so. so some people just walked in and um, have any of you, have you guys ever used Sage before? No. No? Have no. you used Sage before? No. No? Okay. So should I go back really quickly and uh, reintroduce it or uh, it's sort of the end of the talk? But, um, okay, well, if, we'll see. Okay, so. Yes, because. Yes. It, yeah, I mean, Is everybody it? else already yeah. knew him the yeah. time, so. It, Sorry. Well, well, no, 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 we had one person, but. <laughs> okay, so. We have a second cut of introducing Sage for our video. <laughs> okay. We'll take the last one over to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. So, um, all right, I'll really quickly go over what Sage is again. Sage is a free and open source mathematics suite that is uh, attempting to create a viable, completely free alternative to these four proprietary programs, Maple, MATLAB, MAGMA, and Mathematica. And so what Sage is, is it's, it's uh, a big set of all sorts of, all your favorite open source mathematics software. So that's what you get when you get Sage. You get all these different programs. It's also hundreds of thousands of lines of new code that uh, tie these systems together and implement new functionality where there, where there are gaps in this. And it's a way of combining and connecting all this existing math software. And so Sage is a very new 
project. It's only three years, it's less than three years old. Um, and it's seen 150 releases in three years. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, current and active work going on. It's a very hot project, so it's exciting. Um, Sage leverages all these open source programs. It uses Python, which is what you use to interact with Sage. Um, so, uh, and Python is, unlike most um, uh, computers, uh, computer mathematics systems is not an own, or not, it is not unique to Sage. It's a very popular mainstream object-oriented language. So um, it's a key difference between Sage and those um, other programs. And it's freely available on these different systems. You can use it on the command line, or you can use it um, through the web interface, which I was demoing. And, it's very easy to find documentation, so if you want to find documentation, you can type something and then hit tab and it will show you all the completions. And to get help, you press question mark, press tab, and it will show you um, all the, uh, uh, the documentation for that function. And you can get the source code really easily by hitting question mark twice. So, yeah, so I was showing a demo and I won't go back to doing all this. But there's some very cool, pretty things you can do um, by writing Sage. So it, this is a function that, um, that adds together a bunch of plots, in other words, superimposing them onto them, and then shows them at the end. So yeah, there it is. So the different partial sums which approximate the Fourier, uh, or which approximate the uh, square wave. And What's very cool is this feature here, plot animated GIF. And what you do is you give it a list. In Python lists are surrounded by brackets like that. So you give it a list of different um, uh, images. So we see it, it appends things to this list. So it starts out as a list with just the square wave. And then it appends these other plots onto it and then animates them together for you. So you get this very cool little nifty in browser animation, just like that. Um, you can see it approximating. But you could right click and copy to your web page or whatever. Because it's just an right. animated GIF. Right, yeah, there's nothing, there's no flash or anything. Right there. Um, so, yeah, that's just some other stuff that I can show. So, going back to the slides. This is good now that people are actually here. You can help with Sage. So there's a little quote from bash.org about Python. So does anyone here know Python or implement any? Well, first of all, has anyone here, thank you, has anyone here written a computer program before, even if it's just a simple computer program or something like that? So, okay, so, good. So, and everyone here, I assume, likes mathematics. So it's a great intersection of, um, of uh, mathematics and uh, computer programming. So um, Python is fun and easy to use, and Sage is. So everyone who uses Sage has to use Python to actually interact with Sage. So you're sort of automatically a developer just by being a user, because Sage is also implemented in Python. Um, and there are lots of things to be done <laughs> in Sage, and so there's a bunch of projects that people are interested in that uh, could use work on. And so I listed a couple of them. Do you get paid? Yeah. You can get paid. It is possible. Raise your hand if you've been paid to work on Sage. Raise your hand if you've been paid more than $5,000 total to work on Sage. There yeah. are. Yeah. Is it bigger, or who's, what? who's paying bigger? Do you have another grant? Or? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, vigor and another grant. And other grants in the pipeline. So. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a sage.com and then we'll all get rich. So. <laughs> and then we'll be broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. At least you have to say you had a dot com. <laughs> so. Yeah, so there's lots of really projects. How about, how about scripting? So what do you mean yeah. by scripting? About Sage files. 
So yeah, so if you want to like, I mean, so, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, like, scripting the scripts and executing them and seeing. Well, okay, well, so, I mean, that whole web interface was just. Uh, you mean like writing serious programs? Yeah, sure. Like serious pro okay. Like oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. I see what you're saying. Okay, well, so you, the the web interface is great for prototyping and testing out things and playing with things because that uh, uh, that that uh, interactive flavor to it. But if you really want to, you know, write out some hard mathematics, uh, you can make a .sage file, which is really just a .python file, and um, at the end of the day, that's what it really is. You can attach it to your Sage, well, load it to your Sage session, and um, and uh, run the code in the script. So I mean, it's just it's just writing Python basically is what it comes down to. Or you can type, you know, Sage my script dot Sage. And yeah. But also, it's, I mean, anything you can do in Python, you can do with Sage and view Sage as a library for Python. And Python is a real programming language, so it has lots of support for namespaces and pretty much all yeah, the modern features yeah, you can imagine. Very, Compiled code. For example, there's something called Cyclone, which allows you to turn Sage code into compiled code automatically. Which basically the main developer of Cyclone is right here. So <laughs> yeah. So like there's this uh, common. Uh, it's well known that Python is very slow, and that's quite true. But as are all interpreters. As are all interpreters. Yeah. And so um, not all of Sage rests on Python directly. So there's this Cyclone, which is really pretty fast. Know, almost as fast as writing direct C, for example, if you write good Cyclone code. I mean, you have to know what you're doing to get fast code, like anything. Um, it's not for free, but um, it is possible to to combine uh, to combine um, uh, you know um, this, this sort of nice easy to use scripting stuff with uh, with fast low level compiled code. So. And, and get the performance you want out of it. Um, and also, the the fact, I mean, you know, using Python as a mainstream language is actually very nice, and it comes, I mean, like, even in, um, like, when I'm working on something, and I want, I'll, I'll, I'll make an object, I'll make a class or something like that when I'm doing something, you know, when I'm experimenting or something like that, and use that as a nice abstraction for what I'm dealing with. And it's really very easy and very quick to do that. So it's actually really convenient to have a language like Python um, available to you to, to use. Yeah. It'll serve so, you well for yeah. a lot of other things besides math. You can do yeah. anything in Python. Yeah. Which is nice. But it also works very well for math. It's a, it's a nice thing so, yeah. so if I was a new user to Sage and you know, maybe I haven't used Maple or Mathematica or you know one of the M's before, uh -huh. um, how would I go about Figuring out how to do it, and like, oh, what like tools are available you... to learn how to use Sage? Like, is there a okay. tutorial? Yeah, my teacher doesn't know Sage. <laughs> um, okay, well, yes, there is. So there's a Sage website, and you can just go to that. It is Sage Math. Actually, just go to the next slide. The website is SageMath.org. And you can click on documentation, and there's all sorts of good guides, including a tutorial available. Um, there's tutorials and a lot of dates, um, but there should hopefully be work on that soon to make it better. Um, if you want to try Sage out, if we go back to that web page, um, you can use Sage online here, 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 and it's as simple as clicking on it. The page to load, and then you can create a uh, username. Don't worry about the email address; you can put garbage there. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you can, uh, unless you, yeah, and then you can create uh, your account on here, and then start playing around with it as if it were a sandbox and get used to it. So you can use it without having to install any new um, software, which is really handy. And if I made a, a worksheet on there and I wanted to share it with my friends. Oh, yeah. yeah I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to. Well, let's see. Do um, you want me to cover up your username? 
I just don't remember it actually. <laughs> um, but we can go back to here. So uh, let's say we really liked. So yeah, so I'll show this a little bit. So actually, so let's say we really liked uh, this worksheet that I wrote a while ago, and we want. So now pretend this is on the the, the public notebook. And if you want to play around with it, do some stuff. You like what you have, then you can do publish this or wait share, and you could give people usernames who you want to share with, just sort of in the same vein as uh, if you've ever used Google Documents, similar to that. Um, and you can publish, which gives you a static HTML version of the whole thing, just like that, so you can use it to show off something that's nice. Um, and if someone has an account, they can actually click on this and get a, a new copy of it that's their own that they can then mess around with without actually affecting the thing that you published. So it's, that's really handy. And I should also explain how to like, use the interface. There are a couple things I didn't explain. So um, if you want to, uh, so if you see I'm moving my mouse up and down here, and when I get over that little area, it highlights. When that's highlighted, if I click, I get a new cell. And I can type things in this cell. Like, And then, uh, so, yeah, I can do stuff. And if I want to delete the cell, I just delete all of its contents, press delete one more time, and it's gone. Um, if I want to, um, if I want to, uh, oh, right, evaluating, that's, part of, that's pretty important. So, I'll type that in again. If I want to actually run something in a cell, what you do, and this should be written right up here, so. If you ever need help within the notebook, you can go to this. Just click help in the top, and it'll pop up a little window with basic help on using the notebook interface. But to just evaluate a line, you just hold down shift and then press enter, just like uh, Mathematica, I think it is, which has that. It's, yeah. So yeah, that's how you would actually use it, um, which is important. Thanks for um, that detail. Um, so yeah, you can go. Um, there's a UW Sage seminar which is happening uh, every Monday at 5 p.m. starting next Monday. Maybe sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. Um, tell your friends about Sage. How's the statistics? <laughs> um, Mike Hansen, who's a Sage developer in Wisconsin, t um, posted a package that allows you to build R into Sage. And there's a Python interface to R that's already been well developed by other people. So the short answer is you could use R with uh, via a Python interface like in the notebook, and um, it might not work smoothly yet because I don't know how much it's been used. But the technology is all there, and it has been used a little by certain people. Um, I mean, there's already a pretty active community around using R from Python that existed long before Sage. So there's something called RPy. But it, it's been packaged for use with Sage. It hasn't. It's just that was a few days ago, literally. Oh, so yeah. Um, but yeah, so our support from Sage should be very good in the near future. Um, and is it all in Xeno or or anything? Uh, there's probably an old version. If you're really seriously interested in using Sage, I can give you an account on a better machine than this. But I don't know, Robert. You could answer that better. Um, help that sometime way. when like all of the other fires, like getting email reliable <laughs> users go away, <laughs> sure. Then uh, I'll probably um, set up an account, like set up a Sage Xeno that we can, you know, update to that place. Okay. But there's like a. But I can give you a year old version computer. of Sage, which I don't know. Year old version of Sage is about. 25% of the functionality of <laughs> Sage nowadays. <laughs> 150 releases in two years. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's unless there are other questions. Um, that's what it is.